Welcome to Hood Politics. In this episode, I will be discussing checking in and gangs targeting celebrities. The facts of the case are as follows. Los Angeles has always been a necessary stop for those in entertainment and sports. Industry giants such as Universal and Warner Brothers have movie studios and record labels based in LA. Sports teams such as the Dodgers, the Lakers, the Rams, and the Chargers all call LA home. And with LA being the gang capital of the nation, these worlds sometimes cross paths. And when they do, the results can be deadly. One of the ways to sidestep this issue is to check in. Checking in generally means if someone travels to a city, they should get in touch with a local gang or major street figure to guide and protect them during their stay. In return, the ganger figure can receive anything from money to a feature for one of their local music artists to business connections, among other things. Some view checking in as a courtesy, while others view it as extortion, citing that there is a consequence to not checking in, and if it was just a courtesy, there wouldn't be. When celebrities move to LA, most align themselves with gangs. These connections allow them to remain safe while moving around the city and keeps them from being victimized by other gangs or figures. One famous case involved a basketball legend and Shaquille O'Neal. Shaq was a basketball phenom and is still regarded as one of the best players in NBA history. In the summer of 1996, Shaq was a free agent after leaving the Orlando Magic and everyone wondered where he would go next. A few weeks later, it was announced that Shaq signed a seven-year deal worth $120 million with the Los Angeles Lakers. Shaq had massive success with the Lakers and in 2000, 2001, and 2002, he won three consecutive championship titles with the team and was named the finals MVP for every one of those seasons. During Shaq's time in LA, he aligned himself with the Main Street Mafia Crips. Main Street is a gang located on the east side of South Central, and they have always been known as money makers. A man named Liddell Rose, also known as Dell Dog, was a high-ranking member of Main Street. Dell Dog was the true definition of a hustler. He owned multiple businesses, homes, and cars. It's even said that he owned the first Rolls Royce in South Central. He also had a car club called Mafia for Life and a record label called For Life Records. He had deep connections in the streets, as well as the entertainment industry and people like Ice Cube, Snoop Dogg, and Steve Harvey considered him a friend. You go to a guy like Dale when you got a problem and say, look, man, I'm having a problem. I can't get this done because this guy's over here doing this. I can't get this done because that guy's doing that. Dale may know the people that's really in charge of that and put in a phone call and say, hey, man. Shaq had a close relationship with Dell Dog and other Main Street members. Shaq was protected and Main Street was indulging in business deals and building industry connections through their relationship with them. For years, everything was running smoothly, but things took a turn for the worse. Shaq and his business partner, Mark Stevens, owned a record label called Deja. The two had an agreement with the Main Street member named Robert Ross, also known as Stutterbox. The agreement stated that for every artist Stutterbox brought to the label, he would be given a 50% cut of the profits. Stutterbox claimed he brought Ray J to the label but was cut out of the deal. This led to friction between Shaq and Stutterbox and the two stopped dealing with each other. But Shaq was still on good terms with Dell Dog and other Main Street members. Stutterbox still wanted what he felt was owed to him, so he decided to blackmail Shaq into paying them. Shaq would take women to Stutterbox's house and have relations with them, all while he was married to his wife, Shawnee. Stutterbox had security cameras set up throughout his home and claimed that one of those cameras captured Shaq cheating on Shawnee in July of 2007. He threatened to release the footage to the public if he wasn't paid. On Monday, February 11th, 2008, Dale Dog and other Main Street members met up with Stutterbox at a Pink Dot convenience store located on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. The group surrounded Stutterbox's Rolls Royce with guns drawn. They then got into his car and ordered him to drive to Dale Dog's house in South Central. Once there, Dale Dog pistol whipped Stutterbox and demanded that he hand over the tape and $100,000. Stutterbox said that he would get the tape and bring it back to them. The seven men then took his Rolex watch, diamond chain, earrings, and $15,000 in cash and let him go. After the attack, Stutterbox went to the 77th Street Division Police Station. His face was bleeding and his clothes were mangled. He reported the attack to law enforcement and all seven men were charged with robbery, kidnapping, assault, and conspiracy. Stutterbox implicated Shaq and Mark in the attacks, saying that Dale Dog and the others were acting on Shaq's behalf. He went on to tell investigators that Shaq asked them to commit a list of crimes while they were on good terms. This list included killing a member of the downtown gangster Crips after the member disrespected 
to Shaq in front of Shani. He also said that Shaq asked him to kill a woman that he had once impregnated. He also claimed to have been asked to break an NBA player's shooting arm, among other things. During this time, Shaq and Shani were in the process of divorcing. Stutterbox claimed that he began having relations with Shani, and Shaq hired a private investigator to follow them. According to Stutterbox, this added to Shaq's animosity towards him and gave even more reason for him to orchestrate the kidnapping and assault. Shaq and Mark denied knowing anything about the attacks. Shaq said he met several Main Street members during toy drives in South Central, but said he didn't have a personal relationship with them. At the time of the attack on Stutterbox, the FBI were in the process of building a case against Main Street. During the wiretapped calls, they heard Dell Dog tell Mark that Stutterbox had went sour and that he had been contacted by the police. Investigators also obtained phone records, which showed numerous calls from Mark to Dell Dog around the time of the assault. Neither Shaq or Mark were ever charged in the case. Stutterbox later told investigators that he was bluffing about having a tape, saying that the camera cycles periodically and the tape no longer existed. During the trial, Stutterbox took the witness stand against the other mainstream members and detailed the attack. The defense detailed Stutterbox's criminal record and labeled him as a liar, using his false claims of having the tape as evidence of him being unreliable. Ultimately, Dell Dog and the others were found not guilty. In July of 2011, Stutterbox sued Shaq for failure to honor an oral contract and having him assaulted. The lawsuit was dismissed due to it being filed after the statute of limitations expired. On Wednesday, July 8, 2015, at around 11.30 p.m., Dell Dog was shot and killed near the intersection of Broadway and Century Boulevard. I won't get into the particulars, but I will say that it wasn't gang-related and he knew his killer. Stutterbox can still be seen going back and forth with people online from time to time regarding the particulars of this case. Another case involved rapper Busy Bone from the group Bone Thugs and Harmony. On Monday, January 5th, 2009, Busy visited the Universal Studios Hollywood theme park. During his visit, it, Busy stayed at the Universal City Hilton Hotel. Later that night, he ventured to a nearby restaurant and bar called the Saddle Ranch, where he caught the attention of two women. Shortly afterwards, the women approached him. One of them asked him for a picture, and the two began talking. Meanwhile, the other woman stood a few feet away, talking on her cell phone. The group then went to Busy's hotel room, where they smoked and drank. One of the women kept leaving the room to talk on the phone, which initially put Busy on edge, but he was reassured by the other woman that everything was okay. About 45 minutes later, a group of men made their way into Busy's room. Once in his room, they beat him, choked him, and robbed him of $35,000 worth of jewelry. The group then fled the scene while Busy stumbled out of the room and went for help. Using the hotel surveillance system, investigators were able to get footage of the men and the getaway vehicle. On January 10th, the car was pulled over and the driver, a man named Marlo Jones, was arrested. Marlo, also known as Bow Wow, was a reputable member of the Grape Street Crips. Ironically, at the time of his arrest, Bow Wow was employed by a gang intervention program called Unity One. He also worked with USC football coach Pete Carroll in his gang reduction program. Investigators continued building their case and before long, three other Grape Street members were in custody. Van Quan Knott, also known as V, Ricky Pearson, also known as Lil BK, and Marquise Goss, also known as Cheese. Investigators also found pictures of the men wearing Busy's chain, watch, ring, and bracelet. All of the men pled guilty. Bow Wow received 12 years in prison. Cheese received six years in prison. Van Quan received 11 years in prison, and Lil BK received 19 years in prison. Checking in isn't a thing specific to LA. Most major cities operate the same way, one of them being Detroit, Michigan, where a man known as Trick Trick is infamous for forcing artists to check in. Rappers like Young Berg, Styles P, Jadakiss, Trick Daddy, and numerous others have been assaulted and or robbed for traveling to the city without checking in. In 2012, rapper Rick Ross's tour bus was robbed by a group of armed men. In 2014, he was denied entry into a venue that he was set to perform at for violating Trick Trick's no-fly zone policy. We have Rick Ross right outside here tonight at about 11 o'clock. When he was pulling up to come into Sherry Park, he was met by a hundred individuals outside. By a hundred individuals outside. We have tried to pull every resource together and ask him to come back. He is in fear of his life. 
Trick Trick's reasoning is that he wants artists and record labels to help Detroit's local music scene, and he will not allow them to eat off the city while giving nothing in return. Singer Chris Brown was in his 20s and a multimillionaire when he began banging Fruit Town Pyru. Fruit Town is a gang located on the east side of Compton. Rapper Soldier Boy was also in his 20s and a multimillionaire when he began claiming Fruit Town. And I'm from Compton? I am from Bompton. You from Compton? Yeah, I'm from Bompton, yeah. I thought you from Mississippi somewhere. Nah, nah, I'm from Bompton. I'm from California, Bompton, yeah. How? And in 2017, Chris Brown and Soldier Boy were involved in a feud. During the feud, Chris questioned Soldier Boy's authenticity when it came to being from Fruit Town. This led to Soldier Boy traveling to Fruit Town territory in order to prove that he's official, but things didn't go quite as planned. Nah, you don't hate it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Nah, nah, nah. Like I said. Bro, stop all that weird ass shit you got cracking before I really knock you out. Nigga, come on, bro. There was also a point in time where rapper Tyga aligned himself with the Five Dudes Hoovers through a member known as T-Rail. The Hoovers would make appearances in his music videos and travel with him to concerts and on tour. But things quickly grew sour after another Hoover member known as H-Crown felt that Tyga was using the Hoovers for protection and street credit while offering nothing in return. This led to tension within the Hoovers between those that agreed with H-Crown and those that sided with Tyga, such as T-Rail. T-Rail felt that H-Crown just wanted a handout. Tyga later fell out with T-Rail and lost his connection to the Hoovers. On Saturday, July 8th, 2017, H. Crown killed a man named David Brown in Raleigh, North Carolina. Afterwards, he fled to Maryland. Two days later, police clocked him doing 91 miles per hour on Interstate 70 and a stolen Nissan Maxima. He initially pulled over when officers got behind him, but moments later, he mashed the gas and took them on a high-speed chase, all while streaming on social media. I'm getting pulled over right now. We're going live, H. Crown. I have no guns, no nothing. Everything is good. I have nothing at all. I'll let y'all know that. And the officer's coming out now. So I'm gonna let y'all see this. I ain't doing nothing. I just want to pull over somewhere where I, can, where I can be at peace with myself. You know what I mean? I want y'all to love yourself, take care of each other, take care of your families. H. Crown received 21 years and nine months in prison. T. Rail went on to jump into the podcast world and now runs a successful podcast called Back on Fig. In 2017, New York rapper Takashi69 reached notoriety after releasing the hit song Gummo. He then followed up Gummo with other hits such as Kuda and Kiki, which featured Fetty Wap and A Boogie with the Hoodie. Takashi was signed to Treyway Entertainment. The company was ran by a man named Shoddy, who was a well known Nine Trey gangster blood. This relationship protected Takashi and allowed him to claim the game. Takashi quickly became hated due to his blatant disrespect towards other rappers in the industry. He labeled himself as the biggest gangster and said that everyone else was just pretending. He would openly diss them, their families, and their dead loved ones in songs and in interviews. Takashi made it known that he refused to check in when he traveled to a city and dared anyone to do something about it. He dubbed his trips to these cities as the Test My Gangster Tour, and Los Angeles was one of the stops. During this time, he was feuding with rappers Spanky Loco, Jabba Loke, YG, Slim 400 and others. So when Takashi made it to Los Angeles, they wanted to make an example out of him. Jabba Loke and a group of Cribs tracked Takashi's movements through Instagram in hopes of catching up with them. Slim 400 barred Takashi from entering Complex Con, and a video shoot that he was at in Beverly Hills was shot up. Takashi maintained his anti checking in stance, but that was all a facade. While Takashi was in LA, he was protected by a Hoover member named Alshon Martin and other gang members. Alshon was also a Treyway artist, and he even took Takashi's group to the Nickerson Gardens and had them check in with the bounty hunter bloods takashi later fell out with shoddy and the nine trey bloods and they kidnapped and robbed him during this time law enforcement was building a case against nine trey and wiretapped their phones during one conversation shoddy and other members were heard planning to kill takashi takashi began cooperating with the law enforcement and was a star witness during the trial his testimony helped send shoddy and the other nine trey members to prison on wednesday december 8th 2021 shortly before 8 p.m slim 400 was shot and killed near the intersection 
intersection of Manchester Boulevard and 7th Avenue in the city of Inglewood. Slim was exiting his vehicle when a man approached him on foot and opened fire. A member of the Menlo Crips named Michael Terry and a woman named Tamara Bell were arrested and charged with Slim's murder. In December of 2022, Jabalok was arrested along with five others for a smash and grab robbery at a jewelry store. Burglaries have always been a big thing with gangs in LA. Within gangs, there are even burglary crews that specialize in hidden homes, and a lot of times, celebrity homes are the targets. In 2018, 13 members of the Six Deuce Brims were arrested after committing a 13-month-long spree of burglaries and home invasions. The crew hit the homes of singer Rihanna, football player Robert Woods, baseball player Yasel Puig, rapper Chief Keith, and numerous others. The crew also planned to hit the homes of basketball player LeBron James and actors Viola Davis and Matt Damon. The crew would track their targets' movements on social media to see when they were away from home. Investigators searched one of the suspects' homes and discovered $50,000 in cash and a pile of Rolex watches, purses, and jewelry. In 2019, a New York rapper named Pop Smoke was making major waves in the music industry. Known for his deep voice and drill beats, Pop came on the scene with a different sound and rap fans quickly took a liking to him. His breakout song, Welcome to the Party, was an instant hit and was given two official remixes. One featured Skepta and the other featured Nicki Minaj. He later released a mixtape called Meet the Woo Volume 1. The mixtape was met with critical acclaim and further cemented him as being the next big thing. Pop spent the next few months doing performances, appearances, features, music videos, and a list of other things. On Friday, February 7th, 2020, Pop released a second project, Meet the Woo Volume 2. The project debuted at number 7 on the Billboard 200 chart and was given rave reviews. Pop was on the high. He traveled to Los Angeles for business, and while there, he rented an Airbnb in the Hollywood Hills. Pop's childhood friend, a man named Mike D, joined him during his trip to LA. In the early morning hours of Wednesday, February 19th, 2020, Pop was at a recording studio, along with Mike D and a woman named Amelia Rose. Pop had met Amelia at the Rolling Loud Music Festival in LA a few months prior, and the two kept in touch. Pop reconnected with Amelia, and she hung out with them at the studio. Afterwards, he invited her back to the Airbnb. At around 4.30 a.m., Pop was in a restroom when a group of armed men made their way into the Airbnb's backyard and up the balcony stairs to the master bedroom sliding glass door. Amelia heard the glass door slide open, and moments later, the group of men rushed into the room. One of the men put a gun to her head and asked if she wanted to die. The men then grabbed her phone and began going through her purse. The others rushed into the restroom and demanded that Pop hand over his jewelry. As Pop handed over his watch, someone in the group sarcastically told him thank you. Pop then lunged at the gunman and attempted to fight back. Moments later, a gunshot went off. Pop was hit in the chest and fell to the floor. Two of the men then began kicking him. Pop pulled himself up and ran out of the room where he was shot two more times in the back. The man then fled the scene. When Amelia emerged from the bedroom, she saw Pop laying at the foot of the staircase. Mike D had awoken with the sound of the first shot. He went out onto the wraparound balcony and looked through the glass sliding door. He didn't see Pop. He then ran downstairs and saw Amelia next to Pop's body. 911 was called and Mike began doing chest compressions. An ambulance arrived and rushed Pop to Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead. He was 20 years old. Real checking in is alerting your alliances and all of the people you solid with, mm -hmm. you know, just in case something goes wrong, somebody had your back. But if Pop Smoke had been a little bit more veteran in the game, maybe had checked in with someone while he was out here, what are the chances that something like that would have happened? Probably drastically reduced 80%. Many blamed Mike D. He had taken a picture with Pop in front of the Airbnb and the home's address was visible in the photo. Some even believe that Mike D set up the robbery due to him not coming out of his room during the commotion and also not alerting law enforcement. Others believe that Amelia was responsible due to the robbery taking place the night she stayed over and the robbers coincidentally entering through an unlocked door while Pop was in the restroom. There were also rumors regarding his crip affiliation, his beef back in New York that could have followed him to LA, and a rumor involving a stolen road. Rolls Royce. In November of 2019, Pop was in LA and borrowed a Rolls Royce for a video shoot. In exchange, he told the car's owner that he would give him backstage passes to a future concert. Pop said that he would return the Rolls Royce the following day, but he never did, and the car's owner was unable to reach him. Investigators later found the car parked outside of his mother's house in New York. The license plates had been changed and the windows had been tinted. They later learned that he arranged for a flatbed truck to transport the vehicle. He had also taken a picture in front of the car at a New York gas station 
investigation. Pop was arrested and charged with interstate transportation of a stolen motor vehicle. Many believe that the car's owner was responsible for Pop's murder. Rumors continued to swirl for months and the investigation seemed to be at a standstill. Detectives had put together a list of potential suspects using surveillance footage, cell towers, and phone records, but they didn't have enough evidence to begin making arrests. When one of the suspects, a minor, was arrested on an unrelated charge, investigators recorded one of his jailhouse conversations where he admitted to being involved and gave a full breakdown of the events. Another suspect named Corey Walker was also arrested and one of his jailhouse conversations was recorded as well. During the conversation, Corey admitted to being the getaway driver and also gave a full breakdown of the events. Before long, investigators arrested three other suspects in connection to Pop's murder, Keandre Rogers, Jaquan Murphy, and another minor. The entire group were gang members. From Hoover, investigators found that the group saw the home's address after Pop accidentally posted it to his Instagram story. He was later contacted by his manager and told to delete it, but it was too late. The group looked up the house on Zillow to get a view of the exterior and interior layout. At around 2 a.m., they drove to the house in Corey's BMW, and one of them went towards the back of the home in order to scout it, but felt too many people were there. The group then left and returned two hours later with more people, and this time in Corey's Infinity. Corey stayed in the car while the others went into the house. Investigators found that a few hours after the murder, the suspects were Google searching breaking news and Rolex watch prices. The watch was later sold for $2,000. Everyone expected the group to be thrown under the jail, but to the surprise of many, they weren't. The charges against Jaquan Murphy were later dropped. Keandre Rogers and the two minors had their cases processed through the juvenile court system. All of them are now adults and are expected to be held until they turn 25 years old. Corey Walker was the only person in the case charged as an adult, and his trial is said to be again in June of 2024. The group was also linked to the murder of an 18-year-old man named Cameron Stone that occurred at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena five months prior to Pop's murder. That case remains under investigation. On Monday, July 31st, 2023, a 55-gallon drum was discovered at Malibu Lagoon State Beach. A lifeguard opened the drum and was horrified to find a body inside. Investigators later identified a 32-year-old man named Javante Murphy as the victim. He had been shot in the head. Javante was the brother of of Jaquan and many theorized that Javante's murder was revenge for Pop Smoke's murder, but that theory was ruled out. In early October, police charged a man named Joshua Simmons with Javante's murder. A second man named Dennis Vance was charged with being an accessory after the fact. Investigators haven't established a motive for the murder, but they said the men were acquaintances of Javante. Joshua was also charged with the January 2023 murder of a man named Anthony Solak in Inglewood. In September of that year, Joshua was the subject of a viral video after he was beaten by workers during a botched smash and grab robbery at a family-owned jewelry store. In 2014, a Philadelphia rapper named PNB Rock was making a name for himself in the rap game. He released a mixtape titled Real Nigga Bangas, or R&B for short. He wrote the project while in jail, and it was met with great reviews. The following year, he released R&B 2, and later that year, he signed a deal with Atlantic Records and released R&B 3, with the standout song being Jealous, featuring Fetty Wap. In 2016, he released a song titled Selfish, which was met with great reception. Later that year, he featured on YFN Lucci's song, Every Day We Lit. Also in 2016, he was included in Rolling Stone's list of 10 new artists you need to know. These feats helped earn him a place in the 2017 XXL freshman class. Also in 2017, he released his first studio album titled Catch These Vibes, which was given great reviews. In 2018, he provided vocals for XXX Tentacion's song, Changes. The song reached the top 20 on the Billboard 200 chart. In 2019, he released his follow-up album, Trap Star Turned Pop Star, which reached the top five on the Billboard 200 chart. Also in 2019, he featured on Ed Sheeran's song, Cross Me. PNB was solidified in the rap game. He built a loyal fan base and the sky was the limit, but he wouldn't get a chance to reach his full potential. On Monday, September 12th, 2022, at around 12.30 p.m., PNB Rock and his girlfriend Stephanie made their way to a Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles restaurant located at the inner section of Main Street and Manchester Avenue in the territory of the 87 Gangster Cribs. At 1.16 p.m., a masked man stormed into the restaurant and went straight to PNB and Stephanie's table. He demanded their valuables, and seconds later he opened fire, striking PNB in the chest and then twice in the back as he fell to the ground. As Stephanie held PNB in her arms, the gunman said, give me that shit or I'll shoot you in the head. She quickly handed over her watch as the shooter stripped PNB of his rings, two watches, and three chains before fleeing the scene. An ambulance was called and PNB was transported to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. He was 30 years old and the father of two daughters, one being shared
shared with Stephanie. Initially, it was believed that a social media post made him a target. Stephanie took a picture of her food, tagged Roscoe's in the photo, and posted it to Instagram. People believe that her post led the killer to their location. Nicki Minaj tweeted, after Pop Smoke, there's no way we as rappers or our loved ones are still posting locations to our whereabouts. To show waffles and some fried chicken, he was such a pleasure to work with. Condolences to his mom and family. This makes me feel so sick. Jesus. PNB spoke about almost being robbed during a previous trip to LA. You feel me? They try to do some type of shit, but they saying that I wasn't on it. Shit. You feel me? Like, yeah. they try to approach me on some cool shit, but I, I'm just knowing too much. I'm from the trenches too, so I'm just like not paying it. I'm not, I'm not taking it lightly. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm clutching and all that. Like, I'm like, bro, what is y'all niggas trying to do? Like, I'm going off for the energy. Checking in doesn't always guarantee someone's safety. PNB had a relationship with rapper and Grape Street member O3 Greedo. He also had been to the Jordan Downs projects and checked in with the Grape Street Crips. Investigators later arrested five people in connection with PNB Rock's murder, and they believe the chain of events unfolded as follows. When PNB entered the restaurant, he fist bumped a man named Tremont Jones before taking his seat. PNB was draped in jury, and Tremont took notice. He then called a man named Freddie Trone. Freddie was a member of the A7 Gangster Crips. Shortly Afterwards, Freddie arrived at the restaurant in a black Buick Enclave. Tremont went to his own car and retrieved a gun wrapped in a towel. He then gave it to Freddie. Freddie then left the area and went to pick up his 17-year-old son, who was also a member of A7. A few minutes later, the Buick returned and Freddie's son entered the restaurant and approached PNB's table. After the shooting, he ran across the parking lot and entered the Buick. They then fled the scene. At 2.28 the next morning, a surveillance camera recorded Freddie leaving his apartment building. Located on 141st Street in the nearby city of Gardena, he was dressed in all black and wearing gloves. He then entered the Buick and drove away. Less than 20 minutes later, at 2.45 a.m., a caller reported the vehicle being on fire on 139th Street near Bud Long Avenue, two blocks away from Freddie's apartment. Two weeks after the murder, on September 27th, the 17-year-old and a woman named Chantel Trone were arrested. Chantel was Freddie's wife and the 17-year-old's stepmother. Officers also intended to arrest Freddie, but they were unable to locate him. During Chantel's interview with detectives, she claimed that she didn't know anything about the murder, but she did see things that made her believe Freddie and her stepson were involved. Chantel said on September 13th, police showed up to their apartment. Before she opened the door, Freddie told her to tell them that he wasn't there, which made her suspicious. She said the police told her that the Buick had been set on fire. She told them that it must have been stolen. She said her suspicion grew after police told her that there wasn't any broken glass where she last parked and the vehicle had no signs of forced entry. Chantel told investigators that Freddie and her stepson were whispering to each other throughout the day. She went on to say that she saw her stepson in the kitchen using a toothbrush to clean PNB's new lane entertainment pendant. She also saw him wearing the gold rope chain that had been attached to the pendant. On September 29th, Freddie was arrested in Las Vegas, Nevada. A woman named Wanisha Evans had driven him there to help him evade law enforcement. Tremont Jones was charged with two counts of robbery, conspiracy, and possessing a firearm as a felon. Wanisha Evans was charged with being an accessory after the fact. Chantel Trone was charged with being an accessory after the fact. Freddie Trone was charged with the murder for the death of PNB Rock, as well as conspiracy to commit robbery and two counts of second degree robbery. The 17 year old was charged with the murder for the death of PNB Rock, as well as conspiracy to commit robbery and two counts of second degree robbery. The legal proceedings in this case are ongoing. These have been just a handful of the incidents that have taken place between Los Angeles gangs and celebrities. Checking in remains a necessary evil and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Please like, comment, and subscribe.